Okay, everyone. So let's start our class today. So today the topic will will a bit change to low level vision is a new topic. But before we focus on this topic, uh, let's have a quick recap on what we discussed uh, last week. So last week we mainly um, discuss on the topic of optical flow. And we know that there is a difference between optical flow and actual motion. So please be careful on this, that there is actually difference between optical flow and motion flow. Motion flow is actually uh, about motion in real world. Okay, so this is motion in the real world. Whenever there is something moving, uh, that is a uh, uh, motion flow uh, in that motion. But optical flow is not necessarily to be motion in the real world. This is apparent motion. Apparent motion is that uh, from the visual uh, perspective, we see there's something moving. Okay, so that is called apparent motion. It is not necessary to be a uh, real motion uh, in the real world, because if there is object, for example, uh, white object, the same as the background here, moving, you will not see this in the pixel value. The pixel value will be mostly the same, right? Uh, but in the physics, in the real world, there is some motion there, but it's not detectable, impossible for us to detect, to detect because the appearance of the, uh, the appearance of the objects and the background are the same. So that is really the, the difference between optical flow and motion flow. Optical flow is again motion that can be captured uh, by images or by video. Right, so that's the meaning of this. And apparent motion can be correct, can also be wrong. So this is can be correct motion, and the other is incorrect motion or fake motion. Actually not fake, but it's just incorrect motion. It's actually not a motion uh, here, incorrect motion. So the correct motion is quite obvious. Uh, you know, if a car, if you have a car here uh, moving and you know the car, <coughs> the car, uh, the, the car of the car is obviously different from the background, then we can see uh, the car is moving. So this is the, what we call correct motion. You see the motion is there and uh, we can predict it, predict the motion. And when we uh, call incorrect motion is something that, you know, you have an object and this object, for example, uh, reduced object. And then you have in the first image, you have this lighting and then the, the you know, the schedule or the self schedule will be in that part. And with the same object, in the second time, you move the location of this light here to there. And then in this case, the, the schedule or the self schedule will be in that part. And if we 
use optical flow, optical flow algorithms, then it seems that there is some motion. Although there actually there is no motion here, only the light is changing. Okay, so this is called incorrect motion because there is no motion at all, only uh, like an optical trick, uh, optical illusion, uh, you can say, that there is, seems like a, a motion. But actually, there is no physical motion here. <clears throat> so this is the difference between apparent motion and motion flow. Any question? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So we discussed this, and for our algorithms, of course, we focus on optical flow here because we are dealing with images, which is based on the appearance of the object in the image. And optical flow can be defined as I, so this one, if you have a brightness constant for space, it will be quite clear that if you see T, then you have I plus Y T equals to I H plus U Y plus V and T plus one. So optical flow is about estimating uh, a factor, motion factors, motion factor, or optical flow factor, flow factor, not motion, but flow factor. And this flow factor is U and V. Right, so it's about predicting the value of an U and V. Right, and based on this PCC, uh, we can have a derivation based on this, we derive further at Ix multiplied by u, i y multiplied by t plus i t equals to zero. So this is the consequence of brightness constancy constraint. So basically this is the PCC. And the most important equation in optical flow. <clears throat> right. And based on this, we have two techniques to solve this equation to find, of course, the, the goal is to find u and v for every pixel, for uh, every pixel, or some pixel if you want, every or some pixel, depending on the techniques that you want to use. Uh, the first techniques uh, that we introduced uh, here in this lecture was Lucas and Canary. Lucas Canadi algorithm. And the second algorithm uh, was Fun and Stun. Lucas and Canadi is basically a sparse and local uh, flow, while Horn and Stun algorithms is dense and global flow. When I say local flow and global flow here, I'm, what I mean here is the optimization techniques. So this is local optimization. And this one is global optimization. So the main idea of Lucas and Kanade is that we want to minimize u and v for the equation that we have i x u plus i y p plus i t equals to zero. So this is the uh, uh, equation uh, for solving Lucas and Kanade, the cost function, the objective function. And for Horn and Skunk, the objective function is a bit more complex because we have to consider the global uh, optimization. So we have E U V for every pixel uh, in the map U and V. We want to have uh, X plus uh, X U I Y V plus I T square plus alpha 
multiplied by the smoothness constraint, which is the nabla, the magnitude of nabla square plus nabla u, nabla u square plus nabla uh, v square. Okay, so that's the optimization equation or the objective function E, but this one is uh, ex expressed in a local way. There's nothing global here. The only difference here is that, you know, uh, this one, there is a smoothness constraint here, smoothness. Well, there is in the look at Canada, there is no smoothness constraint. This one is uh, minimizing the equation. And to make it global, Horn and Scan define J for U and P for all the pixels in U and V map. We integralize this one uh, of E, U, V, D, X, D, Y. It means that, you know, this one is also minimization, optimization te uh, techniques, which means that we want to minimize uh, this J. So we want to minimize based on U and V uh, for this J, U, V. Okay, so that is the basic idea of this. We want to minimize the integral functions of EUV and HDY. Uh, <clears throat> the meaning of this equation here, the meaning of the equation in the green uh, circle is that we don't really focus on the pixel level. We just focus on the global picture. Even though the, pix the local value of U and P or E of U and P is small or big, it doesn't really matter as long as the sum for the whole uh, E for the whole image is small. So that's the basic idea of this uh, J uh, minimization on J. And to solve this, uh, one and scan use Euler Lagrange equation to solve Euler Lagrange. And from this Euler-Lagrange equation, further on, uh, he used, or they use, uh, what is called Gaussian Seidel method to solve the whole equation. I didn't explain the detail of Gauss Seidel method, but you can look at the lecture note for the detail of this Gauss Seidel method, especially the method to solve linear equation. And based on this, uh, this is an uh, iterative algorithm. It's very similar, more or less a bit similar to gradient descent or Newton methods. Any question for this whole story here? So that's our discussion last week. But in Horn and Skunk, there is a problem. So we focus on hand, Horn and Skunk optical flow. There's some problem with this Horn and Skunk. The first problem, <coughs> well, the whole problem is that, uh, you know, it, it is slow and sensitive to noise. The operation is slow and sensitive to noise, it means that it's easy to be inaccurate. The slow thing is we cannot fix because this is uh, the nature of the algorithm. The slow thing is there. It only can be solved using deep learning. So this one can be solved using deep learning. Uh, learn so far. Uh, we, well, we, we will not discuss this either. Maybe if you have time, I can explain a bit uh, later in the end of the, in the course. <clears throat> but this sensitive to noise problem is something that we want to solve. Okay, so this one is too solved. And, well, this is two things, uh, slow, sensitive to noise. And the third thing is actually, uh, Large displacement or large motion, large motion problem. So if the motion is large or the disparity is large, then Horn and Skunk often fail 
uh, to give you correct optical flow. Okay, so this is the main problem of foreign scan. And this is also something that we want to solve. So this is, we want to solve as well, large motion problem. So how to solve this? One of the solution is to have robust objective function. It means that if you look at the conic scan algorithms or, or expression here for the objective function, what kind of function do they use? Quadratic, right? It's a quadratics, and quadratic is a lot of problem with quadratic. It's easy to, to solve in terms of the optimization, but it's also uh, sensitive to noise. Okay, so the robot of the function here is that the fact is that uh, original scan is a uh, quadratic. And this is sensitive to noise. I explained this already, why this is sensitive to noise. And the answer for this, the solution is to use non quadratic, of course. And one of them is a uh, carbonier uh, loss function. And carbonier loss function is expressed as. Fx, if you if x is something that you want to find, x here in your case is u and v, equal to x squared plus epsilon squared power to a. And if a equal to 0 0.5, this one is still convex. Okay, so if a equal to 0 0.5, it is convex, means that if it is 0 0.5, the basic uh then fx equal to square root of x square plus <laughs> x square plus epsilon square. So this one is still convex because if you look at the graph, if you plot this graph, it looks like something like this. And remember the definition of convex. Convex, the definition of convex is that if you have two points and you draw a line, a straight line, the straight line, in this case, the black line, will not cross the edges of your curve. Okay, so the edges of the curve here is this one. If that, if, if they're not crossing the, the line of this red line or the, or the, the function, the curve lines, then it is called convex. But if it's concave, means that these points have to be randomly chosen. You cannot select a, a certain line on or point on. So the difference between concave or non-convex function, for example, if you have non-convex function, if you repeat this A, if A equal to 0 0.2, for example, it becomes concave or non-convex. And if it's concave, the, the, the example here is something like this. This is concave, right? If you have a random point above the, the curve, for example, here and here, then the line connecting this will, well, in this case, it's not, uh, well, but you know what I mean here, right? So if I have a point somewhere here, for example, it, it can it can cross the the curve, and this one is called non-convex uh, uh, function. Okay, and if it's convex, uh, it it will be easy to to solve. But if it's non-convex or concave, it will be much more difficult to solve. But but the basic idea, either this one, either of these two, either of these two, which is uh, 
not quadratic, this one is less sensitive to noise. Less sensitive to noise is mean that it, you know if you have noise uh, in your image, phone and scan, original phone and scan will will break down. It means that the estimation of the flow will be wrong. That's the meaning of sensitive to noise. But if you change quadratic function with this carbonial uh, loss function, then it will be more robust to noise. Even though you have noise in your image, the prediction of the motion, the prediction of the optical flow is still somehow correct, more correct than original phone and scan. Okay, so now what is the difference between these two, right? So now what is the difference between these two uh, function? One is A equal to 0 0.5, the other is 0 0.2. Which one is less sensitive to noise? What do you think? Which one is less sensitive to noise? 0 0.5 or 0 0.2? 0 0.2, right? Because 0 0.2 is more concave, means that it is uh, basically, if you if, and later on, I will I will I will explain to you in detail where this is the case. Because if you have a smaller a, it becomes closer to L one norm or L zero norm. And L one norm and quadratic is actually, by the way, L two norm. And L two norm, I will just explain later on that it is uh, not as robust as L one norm. So as if it's close to L one norm, the function is more robust to noise. So L A equal to 0 0.2 is actually less, less sensitive. However, to solve this equation, when A equal to 0 0.2 is much more difficult. The optimization is much more difficult to handle. And if the optimization is difficult to handle, then you have to use up more approximation. And if you use more approximation, means that your calculation of the optical flow is not accurate. Is a trade off here. You want to be more robust to noise, but the optimization cannot handle. So you have to compromise. And the compromise here is A equal to 0 0.5. So it's A equal to 0 0.5, although this is not as, as robust as 0 0.2, but the optimization much easier to do. If the optimization is much easier to do, then there is not much approximation involved. If there's not much approximation involved, then your prediction of the optical flow can be more accurate. So that's the logic here. And actually the, in the paper, secret of optical flow, they choose A equal to 0 0.5 as a compromise. Okay, so uh, that's the idea here. That's this value, especially for Carbonius uh, loss function, is A equal to 0 0.5. There are many other solutions for non-convex optimization. For example, you see truncated, truncated uh, L2 or truncated what quadratic. Right? So we discussed this a bit uh, last week. So truncated quadratic means that if this quadratic is something like this, you truncate it. Truncate means that you cut uh, this function to be something like this. So the blue function, the blue curve is truncated function. So this truncated function, it is actually, in some cases, can be better than car carbonyl uh, loss function. The difference is that for carbonyl loss, loss function, it is differentiable. Whatever A that you use is all differentiable, but truncated quadratic function is not uh, uh, differentiable. Okay, so this is not differentiable uh, because this one is expressed as x equals to either alpha x squared alpha if x smaller than squared alpha square root of lambda. <coughs> so alpha and lambda are the hyperparameters. So this is called truncated uh, uh, quadratics. Here it's likely to be the truncation here will be alpha. <coughs> so 
So, and this one is not differentiable, this kind of function. And as you can see, there is a difference here between these two, right? Between the carbonyl uh, function here and the function here. So there is a difference. If you compare the two, the carbonyl function is actually differentiable and truncated quadratic is not differentiable. So this is another kind of situation that we can have, you know, in the optimization, when it is not differentiable, the optimization is actually more difficult. So I will explain later on how we can deal with the issue one, which is the differentiable one. The solution for the differentiable one, for the optimization, I mean, the solution is called GNC. So the optimization techniques for differentiable cost function, which is uh, either convex or non-convex, uh, this GNC can be used. And actually GNC is a mention in the secret of optical flow paper. If you read the secret of optical flow paper, they use GNC, which is graduated, graduated non-convex city. So that's why this is called graduated non-convexity. It means that you know you you try to solve a non-convexity function. So this is called means that you finish with the uh, non-convexity. Although this is far from from completing the problem because this is only deal with a differentiable function. If it's not differentiable, but you will soon let see that it will be difficult to solve or more difficult to solve if it is not, not differential. Okay, so anyway, so this is the, the story here that we will continue with GMC. So GMC, the non-convexity is optimization uh, techniques. Optimization method. Any questions so far? Okay, so this is the storyline here. That on and scan uh, is sensitive to noise because of quadratic function. And we solve it using carbonyl loss function. And carbonyl loss function, uh, for carbonyl loss function, I mean, if it is 0 0.5, let me see. If it is 0 0.5, you can still use a, a normal solution of, of uh, Lagrangian equation. Oh, sorry, this is a big mistake here. So if it's 0 0.5, not all of them have to be GMC. If it's only been 0 0.2, for example, then you use GMC. If it's 0 0.5, actually you can just use normal solution of one and scan because this is a uh, convex. And convex function for 0 0.5, you can use Euler Lagrange, normal Euler Lagrange equation to solve it. But if it is become non convex when 0 0.0 of A equal to 0 0.2, for example, then you have to use a certain techniques and in this case, a GNC. Any questions so far, anyone? Okay, so there is the robust objective function problem. Okay. The next problem, well, we discussed this already, was, uh, let me see. Uh, cost to find algorithm. So cost to find cost to find algorithms is basically try to solve a uh, large motion problem, large displacement problem. So you reduce the size of the of the map of the input image. So then the distance between between the motion between the the value of U and P becomes smaller. If the value of U and V is smaller, then it will be solvable using original Horn and Skunk. And then you increase into the next level of size of the, of the image. And that's why this is called cost to find, because the further down is more finer and fine. Right? And that's the basic idea of this cost and fine. And in this cost and fine, we have to deal with number T, which is interpolation because we increase in the coarsest uh, level, in the smallest 
image, you have UNV already, and you use this UNV for the next level, which is the bigger, a bigger pictures. And that's why you need to have interpolation to make your UNV map larger. And if you can have your UNV larger, so the illustration here, if you have these two, right? And then you have UNV, this UNV map is small because the image is small. And then you increase this uh, into larger uh, final image. You use UNV here. So you use UNV here to make this one closer to that image. So the green map, the green map here, so the green map here, right, is after you warp the image. Warp here means that you use UNV for the previous stage, the previous level, to warp your image, to transform your image so then this blue and green become closer in terms of the pixel distance. Right? And to, to make this UNV larger, again, you have to use interpolation technique. Any questions here? So that's why the interpolation coming in here. And to make it more robust, because UNV can be wrong, right? Obviously, it can be sensitive to noise. Uh, then you use uh, medium filtering to make the UNV less noisy. Okay, so uh, you use medium filtering. This is just a practical advice that you use medium filtering to further suppress the noise. So this is basically what we discussed last week. Problem number one, problem number two, three, and four. Further on, uh, actually, we have another techniques to improve the robustness of optic, uh, optical flow of fine and scan. And the further techniques is number four, using pre-processing, using low-level vision, low-level pre-processing. So low-level pre-processing here is basically if your input is very noisy, what kind of noisy that uh, input can be is that, for example, if you turn this light off, right, it's become dark. The image that you will take in this kind of situation will be very dark. And this is called low light, low light images. And in low light images, uh, it is not only just dark, because you can actually increase the, the pixel value, right? So you have a pixel value for every pixels. It is low means that the pixel value is very low, means like five, 10 kind of brightness. But this is not a problem because you can always multiply with some constant. For example, if it is 10 or five, you can multiply with 30. Then it becomes very bright, right? The pixel, the image will look like a very bright image. But what happened with these bright images? Brighten image, what happened if you you have dark image and then you brighten it up. What happened with your brighten up image? Anyone has tried this before? If you have low light image and then you brighten this up, multiply with something, what will you get? It is noisy image, exactly. The image will be very noisy. Why the image is so noisy? Because when your, your pixel value is between zero to five, Remember that we have a dark camera noise. Dark camera noise is that if you have a camera like this, and then you close the, your lens, and then you take picture, the value that you will get from the pixel is not always zero. Because of the, why it is not always zero when you close the lens? Because of heat, yes, because of the heat of your camera, because your camera always have battery. And the battery also emit heat. And this heat will influence your uh, CCD. Okay, So your CCD will not be zero even if you close your lens. And that is called noise, dark noise. And this dark noise will influence more your dark pixel because your dark pixel is, really, is between zero to five. And your noise level is really also zero to five. So you cannot differentiate between the true signals and the noise signals. 
And that's the problem of low light images. Low light images is not because of the low light, but because of the presence of noise. Okay, so that's the, 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 the story uh, of low light of noise, right? And this low level vision, because it's very, very noisy, then you need to do some pre-processing for your input image. And one of the pre-processing is to suppress noise, to remove noise. And one of them, on one of the techniques proposed in the uh, secret of optical flow is to use structure texture decomposition. Okay, so there is a techniques later on we will discuss in detail called structure texture decomposition. So we split the image, decompose the image into two type maps, two type of layers. One is called texture layer and the other called structure layer. And presumably the idea is that the noise along with edges will go to the texture layer and the structure layer, which is uh, about the, the surface and less will be less noisy. So you use a structure image as the input of your optical flow, because in that case, it's like a denoising, removing the noise from the input image. Okay, so there will be another story here in the low level processing, which is dealing with noise or denoising. The techniques that we will discuss in the denoising is called ROM. Rudin, Osher, Fatemi, Algorithm. Okay, so Rodin, uh, Rudin, Osher, uh, Fatemi, Algorithm, which is a quite famous algorithm. I think it's proposed by people, all these people, ROF people uh, from Stanford University. Okay, so that's the, the low level pre-processing. Uh, algorithms. And the next, number five here, is to include GCC, gradient constancy constraint. Right. <clears throat> so let's talk about GCC first. Let's focus on GCC. <clears throat> so again, what we will discuss here are a few things. Just keep in mind, that we will discuss about GNC. So number one will be GNC. Number two, later on we will have this one, a lot of process processing, denoising. And number three is GCC. <clears throat> so let's start with number three, which is GCC uh, idea. So GCC, is gradient constancy constraint. And this is different from PCC. So this is different from PCC. <coughs> PCC, we have I, X, Y, T equals to I, X plus U, Y plus P, plus one. This is PCC. And GCC, of course, following GCC idea, means that we have the gradient of I, X, Y, T, equal to the gradient of I, X plus U, Y plus V, U plus one. That's called GCC. And GCC is more robust than PCC when you have um, change of lighting. So for example, if I have this in the first image and then I turn some of the light off. Okay, so the, the appearance of this will be very different. So BCC will not be, uh, doesn't hold anymore. But if you use GCC, it still hold because the gradient of this doesn't, the gradient of the pixel will be more robust uh, uh, against the change of the light. So that's the benefit of using GCC. It's more robust to the change of light. It means that if you look at this further, it means that D, the X, I, X, Y, D, 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 Y, I, X, Y, D <coughs> equals to D, the X, I, 
x plus u, y plus v, t plus one, d dy, i, x plus u, y plus v, t plus one. So that's the meaning of this. Okay, so again, you have to keep in mind this, uh, this equation here. Okay, any questions, anyone? Oh, by the way, uh, D, D, T of I, X, Y, T equal to zero. The gradient of a time will be zero, right? Because the gradient is the same. So if you, the gradient of here uh, in one image, and then you take another one in the second image, the gradient will be the same because it's GCC. And if they are the same, then the, the derivative will be zero. Okay, so anyway, so this is the basic idea of TCC. And then uh, you have to, let me see. Mm. Okay, so in, in the end, we have um, this one, we have uh, the, this one is called Ix, and this one is Iy, right? D, dx, uh, di dx is Ix, and d i d y is uh, dy. And if you do the uh, dt on this motion, on this gradient, then it can give you <laughs> uh, using chain rule again, using chain rule, you have d dx of rx and you have dx dt plus d i x uh, dy dy dt plus d r x dt and the other one for dy dy i x uh sorry dx dx dt plus ti y dy dy dt plus ti y dt equals to this one d d d i x d x is the second derivative means that we have i x x u because the x dt is u plus the i, uh, this one is i x y v plus i x t and then i y x u plus i y y v plus i y t equals to zero. It, this is basically the same as a uh, PCC, but we apply this to GCC. And this one is basically the basic idea of GCC. This one is the basic idea of GCC that we want to minimize this equation. The same as what we want to minimize on PCC. So if you compare PCC and GCC, it will be, it will be obvious. So this one, we know that I x u plus I y v plus I t square, for example, if you use quadratic, then this one is PCT. So this one is actually PCT. 
And if you sum this with GCC, then you have a weighting factor, gamma. And because it's a vector and E is actually a scalar, so this E here, so E here is actually a scalar value, right? E is a, a error function. And an error function is always give you a scalar value. And GCC is actually a vector. So then we have to use the magnitude of this vector. So then we can have uh, x, x u plus i x y v plus i x t i y x u plus i y y v plus i y t. So this one is, uh, you know, a square root of the these two elements, uh, the y element and the x element, and then you square it. That's the meaning of this notation here. And this one uh, represents, this one here represents PCC. And of course, we want to have a smoothness constraint. Uh, we keep a smoothness constraint if you, uh, uh, because we use a Horn and Skunk. So we use a Horn and Skunk uh, smoothness constraint. Nabla U2 plus Nabla V2. Uh, yeah, that's all. This is a smoothness constraint. So in this equation, we combine GCT and PCT. Of course, uh, if you, sorry, not PCT here, but this one is PCT. And of course, the, the optimization will be more complex because you have these two with the, the second term there. But I will not discuss the optimization in details here, but the logic is the same, like, uh, you know, because everything here is a hypothetic function, you can use Euler Lagrange uh, as in the on and scan to do the optimization. Any questions so far about, about this GCC? Anyone, any questions? Okay, so if there is no questions, uh, that's all for GCC. And let's move on to number one. We finish with number three. Let's move on to number one, which is uh, GNC, credit non-convexity for solving a uh, non-convex function. For example, if A equals to 0 0.2, uh, what can we do? Right? Okay, so let's have the first have a basic idea uh, of GMC. Again, GMC uh, works if you have a differentiable function. So for example, here, if you use carbonyl uh, cost function, then it is a, a differentiable function. <clears throat> so let's see. Um, the basic idea is that now, intuitively speaking, if you have this kind of function, which is very complex function, So if you have this kind of function, right? So this is your F or your E, Italy, the error function or X. <coughs> in your in, in the real problem of optical flow, of course, this one is actually the error function of U and B. You know, in the original function, there are two variables U and B, which is difficult to, to draw. So that's why I just use X. But you have to imagine that x here is the same as u or v. Okay. So the the problem here is that you have uh, x here as the thing that you want to find, and you have e here, e of x, and the function, the error function that you have is quite complex. It means that if you use normal gradient descent algorithm. For example, if you start with the uh, initial value 
here, if you start the value here, this is the initial, the initial x, for example, then you will end up with this local minima. And this local minima will not be optimum because the optimum one is actually here, right? So that's the problem that you have. And to find the good initialization is very, very difficult. And this is the problem of non-convex function. This is non-convex, right? Because if you have two, two points, in this case, uh, I select above the line, above the curve, that one, for example, it will cross the line. So this is one cave function or non-convex function. And this non-convex function always gives you this problem of local minima. Okay, so what is the basic idea of GMC? The basic idea is actually quite smart in a way. Um, so basically, what you need to do is to have approximate function first. So you approximate this function of right function using green function. Okay, so uh, for example, this green function here. This green function is convex. This green function is convex function approximating the real function that you have, which is in this case, uh, e of x. And we know that the correct global minimum or global minim yeah, minimum is here. That's the correct global minimum. This is the correct answer. So this is the correct answer. But using the green line, what you will get is actually, hopefully this is a, a good thing. So I'm not, let's put something that's predictably good. Let's see. Uh, okay, so let's, let's find if this is fine. Okay, something like this. Yeah. <laughs> so in this case, if you optimize this on the green line, you have modified E here, E prime of X. So E prime of X is the green line. And then you, if you optimize this, you will get the point there. So this one, the point that you will get. First estimation of X. So first estimation, X1, right? X optimum one here. Yeah. And that one, if you put this into your error function, if you fit this into your error function, your error function will give you that one, which is not the optimum one, but this is the first step. And once we have that, then we modify the green function. I will tell you later on how we modify this. But we the green line is actually uh, the green line is actually coarse approximation, and we want to have something that is closer to your the original e. So the next step is to make it closer. And to make it closer, uh, I will tell you later on how to make it closer. It's enveloping the, the, red, the, red, the red line, but uh, with the different, uh, cost fun the different cost function and different optimum point. So in this case, the optimum point will slide here and keep that to give you that point. And you're repeating this, this approximation on and on until it converts, until certain, certain iteration. Okay, so that's the basic idea of GMC, that you envelope the, the original function with a very approximated function first that is really convex. And then you make this envelope function closer uh, to the original function. And then try to optimize based on this approximated function first. Okay, so, and then we repeat this process again and again until you eventually have the, the you work on the original function. <clears throat> Any questions here? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I will tell you later on. If this is just intuition first. Uh, I will let you, uh, I will give you the exact uh, uh, example soon. 
for their intuition here. Any questions? Yes. Uh, in, in our clinical cases, uh, how can we guarantee that we can find the convex green lines in the of this? Yeah, that's the difficult part. Uh, the difficult part is how we can get the envelope green line, right? Uh, but that's, of course, it's not general, general, generally solvable. But for some cases, it actually can be solved. Uh, so I will tell you later on uh, how we can do that, how we can approximate the, the function using the green line. So it's not always uh, solvable, though. Uh, I have to mention that. Yeah, it can be any function. Yes, that's true. So uh, this, this approach does not work for every uh, original red line. I'm not really sure if this always uh, 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 can be approximated for any function, but uh, most of the function, I think, as long as it's differentiable, it should be approximatable, uh, can be approximated. I mean. So I will give you the exact example first, so then you can see how it works. Okay, so let's talk about optical flow. So in optical flow, for example, you have Your E, your original E, you know, FB, this is the original function, the red line, equal to F, and F here can be uh, L2 norm, quad quadratic, for example, or any, sorry, not quadratic, but any non convex function, L1 or L0. FIHU plus IYP plus IT. Again, this is not quadratic. It can be any function that is non convex. Plus alpha F nabla U plus F nabla V. So in the original form and scum, F here is quadratic function. So in HS, in HS, F function is a quadratic function. But in robust HS, which is a non-convex, robust HS means non-convex, uh, this can be Fx here, can be, uh, for example, carbonial uh, function when A, less than 5 or 0 0.5. When A is less than 0 0.5, then carbonyl function will be non-convex. Okay, so let's imagine this. This is your original. So this one is not the case. This one is not the case. This is the case that we have non-convex function of for F. And you try for this case, it's quite simple. So let's look at the uh, modified or approximate function EQ. And EQ U V here is a quadratic function. So IX plus U plus IYV plus IT square plus alpha U nabla U square plus nabla V square. <coughs> So EQ here is actually the original HS uh, function, which is quadratic. And it is because it is quadratic, then it is actually um, convex. Okay, so this is one of the strategy that you use uh, L2 norm to approximate. So then our evolution evolution of the envelope so eq here is the original envelope right? and then remember that you don't really just rely on eq but we modify eq on and on and on and further so the evolution of of e c is the of evolution of e uv 
equals to lambda eq uv plus one minus lambda e uv. Okay, so the idea is that if it is the first approximation, the initial green envelope, then lambda equals to lambda equals to what? If I want to make the green line, lambda equals to anyone equals to one. When lambda equals to one, then the second term will be zero. It means that we ignore the non-convex function. We only focus on the convex function. Uh, sorry, non-convex. So yeah, the convex function because EQ is the convex function. So we focus on this first in the beginning. And of course, we have to solve this globally. Remember that in Horn and Stump, we try to solve this function, right? J U V equals to the integral double integral of E C U V D X D Y. So if we use this E C here in the in the solution in Horn and Stump solution. So in the first iteration, so in the first iteration, lambda equals to one, and this will produce. will produce uh, um, a UV map, which is a very approximation. It's not really a crystal accurate, but at least we can have U and V based on the green envelope. And perhaps, of course, this have to be done bit by bit, but uh, you can set it to 0.5, for example. And this one, the initial the UNP for this lambda equal to 0 0.5 is uh, UNP. <coughs> UNP1 here. Okay, is that imaginable? So we set 0 0.5 means that this one now uh, 0 0.5 and this one also 0 0.5 means we combine uh, the convex function and non-convex function together. Because they are differentiable, we can use Euler-Lagrange equation to solve this. So the Euler-Lagrange is still there, but we don't directly apply this to E, to non-convex E. We apply this bit by bit, so then the initial value can be more accurate and more accurate. So the key here is actually the initial value for the solution. So again, uh, in the end, you can set, uh, in the end, you can set lambda equal to zero and you set u and v in it equal to u and v when uh, lambda equal to 0 0.5 and then you compute uh, using euler Lagrange to produce the final U and V. So this is basically the basic idea of how we modify uh, the uh, approximate the solution and then evolve from there. Right? And what is the difference uh, if you just apply euler Lagrange directly to this function, to the original function here, so if you, what happens if you directly apply all the Lagrange on this equation here, what happens then if you apply the Euler Lagrange directly to non-convex function? It is differentiable, it means that you can get the solution because it's differentiable. The problem with this is again, uh, if you consider the, this function here as a red line, it is easily trapped into minimum, uh, minimum or local minimum, and the estimation will not be accurate. Any questions here, anyone? 
again, this is not a, a solution for any function, as you can see here, right? Uh, because if the function is so complex, for example, then we cannot know what will be the second approximated function to envelop that function. But in this case, we know that it can be enveloped using quadratic, for example. Then we use quadratics as the envelope for the function. And this is useful again for initialization. If your function is so complex and you don't have any tools to do the initialization, and that become a problem. So again, uh, for the approximation, uh, the approximation can work uh, if we can have a function that can initialize uh, the original non compact function. Any questions here for GNC? Yes. Yeah, this is a bit difficult uh, questions. Uh, we do not know, uh, but this one is, uh, you know, depending on how much you want to be accurate compared to the processing uh, time. If the stride is small, of course, it will be more accurate. You will be not likely that you will get trapped into very narrow uh, local minimum, right? But the cost is that it will be very slow because you have for one lambda, for example, you have to do the horn and scan whole process, which is quite long. And you add that with this lambda process step-by-step, step, it will be much longer. But again, if it is not, the size of lambda is small, it will be more accurate, predicting the narrow, uh, narrow local minimum. Any other questions, anyone? Yeah. The GCC is actually differentiable. Okay, so uh, imagine that U V here, U U V here is similar to GCC basically. So you just add that in the in the computation of long discussion that we had last week. Yeah, good questions. Any other questions, anyone? Okay, so if there is no question, let's move on. Uh, that one is uh, the solution for number one. We have done number one, we have done number three. Now let's move to the low level preprocessing, which is uh, the main topic of today's uh, topic, which is uh, low level vision. If I move to low level vision, any questions here after this point for optical flow? Okay, so perhaps I can show you. Um, I give you some illustration what is the meaning of this uh, Lola. I think it's text sometimes. Um,
Okay, so this is the things that uh, I would like you. Yeah. So this is the uh, nighttime images. So if you have a nighttime image, uh, the original image look like this. This is quite low light, quite dark, right? But if you multiply this one with a constant value, you can brighten this up. But as a result of that, it can be very, very noisy. Okay, it's because the signal to noise ratio is very small. Uh, that's why you can have these very noisy images. Although for human eyes, in the original image, you cannot see the noise because it's very low, right? But you, because you want to have a brighter image, when you brighten up the image, then it will give you these artifacts everywhere. And that's something that we want to solve. Uh, how we can suppress this kind of noise. So keep this in your mind. Okay. Um, all right. So. <laughs> The problem that we want to solve again is this uh, structure texture decomposition. Again, this is also mentioned in the secret of optical flow. Um, so the discussion is on structure texture. <laughs> decomposition. And the algorithm that we want to use is called um, Rudin Osher pattern. So this is ROF for So I think it's a uh, It is well known uh, algorithm. <laughs> it's called total variation. So total variation denoising here is already also in Wikipedia. Uh, if you look scholar. So the original, <coughs> this one is the original uh, paper, nonlinear variation based noise uh, removal algorithm. Uh, so this is cited already 7,000, 17,000 times, which is similar to optical flow citation. So this is a very well-known uh, algorithms. Um, and yeah, so we will discuss this. Okay, so what is this algorithm uh, about? Um, first of all, according to the algorithms, we can split image into two things, which is called IS plus IP. The first one, IS, is called structure layer. Structure layer. And this IP is called texture layer. So what is the difference between texture layer and structure layer? Uh, you can see here. So the left is the input image and the middle here is called structure layer, IS. And the most right is IT uh, or texture layer. So you can imagine that texture layer is basically uh, have edges. And if there's noise, 
then it will go to the texture layer. So structure layer is like cartoon, uh, you know, only the surface, which is very smooth. And there is, supposedly there will be no noise in the IS layer. And optical flow in the secret of, uh, of, of optical flow and many papers, including, they use the structure layer uh, as the input instead of I. And that's why this called pre-processing. Okay, so this is kind of denoising uh, algorithm. Any question here for these uh, two layers? Yeah, I think it's quite intuitive, right? Okay, so that's the goal, how we can correctly uh, split the image into these two layers. But we, we, we want to have a deep exact definition. What is the as well as IT mathematically? So the objective function, the objective function here is that we have IS star, which is the uh, predicted structure layers. So we define the structure layers uh, to be to be something that is smooth. So we want to minimize this objective function based on RS. So we try to find RS, correct RS for every pixel, for every pixel here, pixel X, and RS X minus I X. So X here is actually uh, vectors because it is X and Y. And we have square here. So this is a quadratic function, convex function. And this is the, the second term, actually the main contributions of this ROF, Rudin, Osher, and Patten. And this is lambda, del, lambda is x2. So there is no square here. So originally, if you look at the uh, optical flow, point and scan optical flow, for example, you have two there. You have quadratic function uh, here, right? But in this new definition, you don't have that two. So actually, you don't have this two here. You only have the two at the bottom, which is the uh, Frobenius uh, norm. It means that it's just a normal norm without without quadratic. So. The definition of that there, uh, the magnitude of nabla uh, s x two is the square root is a Frobenius uh, distance uh, d d x uh, s square plus uh, d d y uh, s square. That's it. So that's the definition of the second term. We thought quadratic, it is a square root. In a way, similar to carboniers, uh, where carboniers use uh, 0 0.5, right? Without epsilon, of course. Uh, and this one, if you want to simplify, it becomes I S X square plus R S Y square. And this is what people call, in the paper is called, Total variation. This is called TV or total variation. TV. And this is the only, not the only, but this is the main contributions of this ROF paper. They at this day, they found or invented this total variations uh, term. It's very similar to, to smoothness term, but it's not quadratic. The first term, the first term here is actually quadratic. So the whole thing is the TV, it is called L2 TV. So the whole thing here is called the whole things is uh, L2 dV. L2 dV means that the first term is L2 quadratic, 
And the second term is TV term, total variation term. And that's the definition of IS when we want to have the total term or the, the, the second term, the total variation is to be minimized. So we want to have a difference in quadrat in square root uh, of this gradients of IX, ISX and SY uh, to be minimized. It has to be smooth. Any questions here? Again, if you use quadratic, then it will be gone, right? This square will be gone if it's quadratic and it becomes square. And a square, as I mentioned in the beginning uh, of this lecture, you know, if it is there's a mistake or noise, it will be penalized too much. And we don't want that because that one will make this is sensitive to noise, inaccurate when there is a noise. Okay, so we want to keep that small by having the by keeping the square root. If there is a noise in the in the gradient of S X and S Y, it's still small, not penalized that much. Okay, the solution of this of L two norm uh, L two dot T B is uh, uh, again the same uh, and in one instance. So we have J for every uh, I S equals to the integral integral of I S X minus I X. You know, this one is a data term, means that you know you encourage your structure layers and the input image to be the same. You make them identical for the for the for the data term. But uh, for the second terms, you want to make the delta IS or nabla IS to be smooth, the gradient of IS to be smooth. So again, I repeat this because it's important that RS in the first term is encouraged to be the same as the input image. But then in the second term, you want RS to be smooth. The gradient of RS have to be uh, small. It means that if you have any edges like this, for example, in your image, it will be suppressed in the, in the structure layer. Or if there is any noise, noise is a very sporadic kind of uh, pixel value, like what you saw in the low light image. You know, there is a pixel uh, noise here and there, and that one is also to have a large gradients. And we also want to minimize that one in IS. So in IS, in the structure layers, this kind of noise will be gone, the same as the edges will be gone as well. So that's the idea. So, and then we have to solve this equation. Again, we use the, the same Euler Lagrange equation to solve this problem. Uh, and I don't want to, to repeat the, the process again, it's uh, a bit too long, right? But you know the idea that uh, you use Euler Lagrange and then you solve the Euler Lagrange using kind of uh, iterative uh, manner, iterative algorithm. And if you want to know, you can look at the lecture note for the details of the derivation. But in the end of the day, uh, I just want to say that uh, as new, different from uh, uh, the Lagrange in Horn and Skunk, Horn and Skunk using uh, Gauss-Seidel's algorithms or Gauss-Seidel method. But in these uh, ROF algorithms, they use gradient descent. Okay, so you use gradient descent, uh, gradient descent with, of course, the, uh, the first thing that you need to do before gradient descent is Euler Lagrange. So, um, so you can say that this solution here is Euler Lagrange, Euler Lagrange with gradient descent. So, in this case, it will be iterative algorithm. So, as new equals to as old minus Alpha, yeah, it's a bit too long, uh, but you can see on the next lecture, not later on at home, that this is nabla j i s i s equal to i s old. Oh, by the way, nabla j here is quite a long definition, uh, but again, I don't know. So, right here, you can look at the lecture notes. 
And for the initialization, you can, because it's a uh, uh, getting distance always has initialization, and the initialization of R and in it equals to R. So first you copy the image into IS in it, and then run this algorithm, run this gradient uh, descent, updating again and again until uh, converge, until a certain number of iteration means that there is no change anymore in your IS, then that will be your final IS. Any questions here for the process? Um, so now the question is, what is the benefit of this uh, TV uh, TV trial or TV regularization, right? So I put in the lecture note uh, this kind of comparisons. So the clean image is where there is no noise. Then you have this noisy image, and that's your input. Okay. Uh, so in the, the second row is a uh, second column is actually your, your input. And if you use quadratic L2 norm, you know, L2 norm in the, in the first term and then L2 norm in the second term, then what you have is very blurry kind of output for IS. But if you use uh, L2 TV, which is at the most right, L2 for your data term and TV for your smoothness term, then you can have very smooth, uh, a very nice looking uh, kind of output for your, for your IS. There is a possibility that your first term, the likelihood, the data term, to be L1. But that will be of a smooth, uh, sorry, of a sharp, which is not, not wrong. Sometimes uh, it is a good thing. Uh, but the point here is that, you know, L1 TV is much more difficult to optimize. And L2 TV, why this become very famous is because it's easy to optimize. It's still L2 for the first part. But it's also also give you good performance. Okay, so that's the basic idea why this L2 TV become famous. There are many variations of the TV, as I mentioned again, L1 TV, but uh, the optimization will be quite uh, difficult. Any questions here, anyone? So I can explain to you why this is the case. Why? Uh, L1 or L2 TV, TV here is basically the main drive. So why TV or something that is close to L1 uh, is better than L2, which is this quadratic L2 norm, right? And the most important question is that why L2 gives you some blurry kind of output? That's the question that we have here. Why this one is give you this kind of blurry output? And the basic idea, the basic explanation is that, you know, this red curve is a quadratic function. So if you have ISX, ISY, ISX is the derivative in the X direction, uh, ISY is the uh, IS in derivative of uh, IS in the Y direction, then you will have this function, quadratic function, if you use L2 norm, right? If you use quadratic function. Now, if you look, this curve from the top, if you look at the top view of this curve, you will have this yellow circle. This yellow circle is actually the same as this curve uh, watched from the top. Okay. So imagine that you have this red yellow curve as your uh, regularization term, your second term. And in your first term, you have this green curve. This green is not necessarily to be not necessarily to be convex. In this case, I draw it convex, but it's actually not necessarily to be convex. It can be in any di different kind of shape, even if a non-convex is fine. But then when you try to optimize, it means that you want to find the optimum intersection between these two. Because there is a battle between the first term and the second terms, right? The first term want to be the same as I, to be the same as the input. In the second term, say, no, 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 don't be the same as the input. Be, be smooth everywhere. So there's a battle within that. And then they have to compromise. The compromise point is the intersection point between these two terms. And if you see here, it's likely if your 
if your function is a rep curve, the intersection will be in non-zero value. Non-zero value means what? Non-zero value means that this one is not, not zero. So the gradient will not be zero because the intersection will never be in this location, for example. If that if the intersection in this location, then it will be zero in the x-axis will be zero. Oh, sorry, in the y-axis will be zero. But because it is likely not to be in the zero intersection, the gradient of our Sx and our Sy will have some value. It's non-zero. Non-zero means non-sparse. So everywhere in your gradient map, if you have a gradient map, before getting into this map, you have a gradient map. Your gradient map is non-zero everywhere. Because your gradient is non-zero, when you convert this gradient into, into in image, you integralize, right? When you integralize non-zero value, it becomes some non-zero brightness, so non-zero pixels. And that's why this is non-zero everywhere. It's become not, not sparse. The gradient is not sparse because it has to be zero. The gradient has to be zero actually, but it doesn't give you zero gradients. And then when you recover the image from these non-zero gradients, it gives you non-zero pixel values. And that's why this is the case here. Non-zero everywhere. Non-zero everywhere means that, you know, this one is supposed to be zero, but it's not zero anymore. That's why it becomes blur. So that is the weakness of this quadratic function. The gradient of the intersection is not zero. And what happens if you have uh, L1 norm, for example? This is L1, right? Uh, L1 means, you know, like, like in California, it's actually, uh, in this case, it's convex, but it's, uh, it's a linear, linear function. So this is uh, the case, uh, it, it is the case that if you have the intersection between the function, the, the data term function and your regularization function, the intersection is likely to be in zero gradient intersection. So it's likely to be in this location here. And if there is a location there, means what? Means the gradient is, either in x direction or y direction will be zero. And if the gradient is zero, it will become sparse gradient. And if it is sparse gradient, it will be, when you construct that from, from the sparse gradient, the outcome will be more sharp because the gradient is zero almost everywhere. So there's a difference between L2 norm quadratic function and L2 PV or in this case, L, L1 TV as well. Is this understandable? This is actually well-known fact in, uh, in optimization community. So if you uh, search L2, 1, L2 norm, L1 and L2 differences, they will explain in this way. So this is the difference between L1 and L2 in terms of the optimization function. L0 will be much, much sharper because L0 means it will be more zero gradients. I think if it's uh, uh, L0 uh, or certain, L1 is actually the, you know, uh, if you have F of X, this one is X up to P, right? The P is the power. If it is uh, more than one, it will be, uh, or p equal to two, it will be quadratic. p equals to one, it will be uh, L1. And if it's p equal to zero, then it will be uh, L0. But there is, there is a value between zero, L0 and L1, which is uh, whatever you call that, right? So in that case, it will be, the, the shape will be something like this. And if the shape is something like that, it will be more spiky. If it's more spiky, then it will be likely to be sparse gradient to so be zero gradient so if this is less than one p equal less than one it will be more sharp more sparse in terms of the gradients all right 
Okay, any questions here? Okay, good. Any questions here? No? Okay, so actually that's all the discussion that we had for for this uh, something related to optical flow. Discovery processing is denoising using FRM. If there is no questions, uh, we will discuss something else. Uh, not really sure on what will be the best here. Okay, so that's not meant to be meant. Uh, okay, so let's have a break first, uh, and then we will continue the discussion uh, later for color analysis, the second session. So we have 15 minutes, uh, uh, and we start seven. 15. So let's start again at 7, 10 minutes to 8.
So let's talk about a very simple Whatever the cloud is that you have to square, it could be something like this. Yeah. So this one means that if you have a value here, then the square will be there. If you have a value here, the square will be there. I know it's not just like that. Yeah, so it is like that. Yeah, so it's like that. Yeah, so it's like that. Yes. So, what is you know the curve means? I know. So this is the a, a plane or volume or what? No, right? It's whenever you have value here, the the, 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 the square will be there. So expand expand it into two dimension. You have f x, you have f y, and then you will have this and this, right? And this one, if if you look, if you circle, yeah, you understand this? Do you understand the top one? This one, hundred percent. So this is the same, exactly the same. And then you said the the gradient, the gradient of like like shows the the state of the other one in the other uh So what where is the equation of vector by equal to zero? So if it is a uh, if it is a uh, x and this one is just a uh, x, it will be line, right? Yeah. You understand this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if I extend this into two dimension, then I will have uh, uh, something like this. <laughs> Yeah, it's the same, right? Yeah. So if I have a smaller one, it will be here. Same as the smaller one. So that is the meaning of of that. So if I look uh, from above, look from above, yeah, then I can say that this one is. Uh, this, right? yes. And if it is this one, it will be something like this. You know the meaning of that, right? Yeah. So whatever the value here, then if you have the value of fx there, it will be there. And if you have another one, another kind of intersection. The intersection is likely to be on edges. 
some HSC or then in the middle here. This one is the first term. You have two terms. Yeah. You have two terms here and here. This is the first. This is the second one is actually this one. The first one is that one. Then they will intersect, right? The intersection is the common point. The optimum point. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's already time. So yeah. we have okay. to stop. Okay. Oh, no, no, it's already four minutes. Okay. Uh, oh, you have to ask the chief. Oh, oh, oh. I cannot answer. Uh, you can the time you can the Yeah, I cannot answer because okay. I do not know. You have to ask oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. 
Okay, so let's start the second session. Uh, so the second session will be based on the slide, uh, and it's a bit dark because my son is black. Uh, and please don't sleep. Okay, uh, although this is a bit darker. Uh, okay, so this is uh, another type of uh, low-level vision, uh, and in this in this case, uh, we focus on the color analysis in computer vision. Okay, so <coughs> sorry. So there are. <coughs> So there are three main topics uh, in this discussion. First is color constancy. Uh, remember the color constancy is that when you have uh, different light colors, then you will have different uh, color of your image. So in this case, we want to apply color constancy algorithm or develop color constancy algorithm to estimate the illumination color from an input image. So that is the first thing. The second thing is, is that uh, in the image highlights is everywhere. So especially the man-made, if you have a man-made object uh, like this, for example, plastic kind of object, you will always have this uh, specular highlight. And uh, specular highlight is almost everywhere, especially for man-made objects. <coughs> Another topic is, uh, Bad weather. So this is a kind of <clears throat> problems. You know, if you have a fog, for example, it will reduce your visibility. Uh, Uh, but the third one is the uh, visibility in uh, in a foggy scenes or fog removal using color analysis. So everything here that we discuss will focus on the color analysis in low level vision. So the first topic is called consistency. Uh, the the actual color on object that is consistent is important for many different applications in computer vision. What I mean with by that is that you know. If you have an object like this, uh, the highlight will change if you change the light direction. I'm not really sure if I have a specular object here. Okay, so this one is a kind of specular. So this one is a specular object, right? So if I move like this, because it's, it's the same like moving the, the light, then the appearance of this pixel will be different, right? This is in inconsistency with respect to the light. So when, when you change the light, the, the surface will change as well. So that's the same as particular highlights. Glossy kind of this kind of surface, when you change the light location, it also changes uh, the, the location of these highlights. The second is the light. The light if the light is red, then your color of the object look like red. Uh, but if you have a light like a white, then the object look white is. Okay, so this is also inconsistent in terms of the appearance of the object. And we want to make object to be, to be consistent, to be consistent in terms of the light, in terms of whenever the colors in that location, for example, we can remove the color of the light so then we can have a consistent color of the object. So that's called color constancy. So we want to have an actual surface color independent from light colors and independent from specular highlights. Now, how we can achieve this goal? So this is the framework. The framework is that if you have a specular highlight objects like this surface, for example, with non-white uh, light, 
we want to change the, or we want to, to remove the light color, estimate the light color and remove it. And then we have the, something in the middle here. This is called canonical lighting, which is in this case, the canonical lighting here is a white light. And then once we have the white light, we decompose the image into diffuse component and specular component. So we want to suppress uh, the, the specular highlights component or to decompose uh, these two, basically. Any questions here for the whole framework? Okay, so now, uh, is it possible okay to have brighter? I think it's okay, right? It's not, it's not too dark. Okay, so now, first of all, to, to solve this problem, we have to know physics. So this approach is called physics-based in low-level vision. And this physics space is actually one of our expertise in our lab. So our lab focus on this kind of uh, physics space, uh, low level vision. So to understand the problem, we have to know the, the law of physics. And the law of physics, first of all, uh, when you have this light and objects, in this case, the green surface is the object, the light will emit uh, energy, in this case, E, E is the energy, that depends on lambda. Lambda is the wavelength, the frequency of, of light. Because again, uh, there is no color of light. Everything is actually energy. It's a wave, it's a frequency, signals. Right? So that's why this depends on lambda, the energy of the wave. And <clears throat> once that hit into the surface of the object, uh, then the surface is actually S, it's a function of x, x is the location of that particular location, and lambda is the, as the surface appearance is also depend on lambda. It's called albedo, albedo or reflectance. So an S here will immediately, for the surface part, it will be immediately reflect the light, and this kind of light is called specular reflection. So this, I here, uh, basically, if you have a surface, then the, the, the light reflected by the object is multiplication between, the, between S, the surface reflectance, or albedo, multiplied by the incoming energy, E. Now, the surface reflectance, there are two types of surface reflectance, or albedo. One is homogeneous objects. And the other is inhomogeneous objects. So what is a homogeneous object? Homogeneous object is like gold, steel, silver. And this is kind of thing is called homogeneous object. It means that the surface is so homogeneous. The object is so homogeneous everywhere on the top, on the bottom, everywhere is the same, the same material. Okay, so this is called homogeneous objects. And for this homogeneous object, light is very difficult to penetrate inside. So it is immediately reflected, not going to the body of the object. But if it is in homogeneous object, in homogeneous means that the, the particle inside the object, they are consists of many different particles, not just from one material, but many different material. So plastics, for example, ceramic, uh, acrylic, all this is called in homogeneous object. And in homogeneous object, for homogeneous objects, the light is just immediately reflected. For example, if you have cold, the cold surface will immediately reflect it everywhere. Okay, so there's nothing that going inside the object. But for in homogeneous object, there is something going inside. So I will explain in this diagram here. So assume that this is plastics, right? Uh, or acrylic or something like that. So if you have energy coming to that surface, some of them, some of them will be reflected immediately to the air. Right. And this one is called specular reflection. And that's the definition of specular reflection. SS, not, no longer S, but SS is the surface albedo, surface reflectance. So for example, you can imagine again for this plastic, this black plastic, right? So something that is shiny is actually SS because of the surface reflection. Okay, so that's how you imagine this. 
I think this one is better. Uh, so you see something very shiny here on this part, right? I'm not sure you can see that. So that one is the shiny, the white thing is because of the light. You can you see the reflection of the light very strongly because of the surface reflection. And some of the light will go through the body of the, of the object. And some of them will be absorbed. And some of them will be reflected back to the air. Reflected back to the air. And that reflection is called diffuse reflection. So, so if you have this uh, surface, we, you see the white, white kind of reflection, right? Because of the light, there's a white reflection. And if you see the black one, that is called diffuse reflection because there is no specularity. But even for the, the shiny one, the shiny one is actually a combination of the surface reflection and body reflection. So I will explain to you, but the diffuse one is actually the black one. So the diffuse reflection, like, like this one, for example, there's no grossiness, there's no peculiarity here. It is called diffuse reflection. Diffuse reflection is that the light reflected uh, into all direction equally. So whatever you see, you see from here, you see from there, are exactly the same intensity. That is called diffuse reflection. But speaker highlight is different. Speaker highlight, if you see from different angle, you will see different intensity of the speaker highlight. Okay. But anyway, so that's called diffuse reflection. And this diffuse reflection is uh, SD, the diffuse reflectance or diffuse uh, albedo multiplied by the incoming energy. So we have two types of reflection, specular reflection and diffuse reflection. And if you combine this, uh, that's what you will get. So I, I is the, the, the intensity of this ball here. So there is a ball here. So the green part is diffuse. The yellow part here is actually combination between diffuse and specular reflection. And this green, uh, the yellow part here, the specular highlight part here, actually described by ID plus IS. The green part is only ID. Okay, and that's how we combine this ID and IS. That's IS here. Uh, IS is specular reflection. And this uh, further on, ID is SD multiplied by E. So this one is SD multiplied by E. And IS actually SS multiplied by E, which is SS multiplied by E. Okay, so what is WD and WS? WD is the geometrical profile of the diffuse. So for example, if I have diffuse object, so imagine that this is, this is a diffuse object, right? Because this look white everywhere without, without reflection, without specular reflection. So if, if you look at the intensity here, for example, at this point, and the intensity there, there is some differences in terms of the intensity value. This is brighter here than here. Right, and that is because the geometrical profile of the cylinder, and this geometrical profile of the cylinder will determine WS. Uh, sorry, WD. So WD is a geometrical profile that is that determine the pixel value, pixel brightness of the surface. So that is WD. WS is a bit more difficult to imagine. WS is basically, uh, you know, um, for example, uh, if WS, I can show you here. Uh, so this one, you can, can you see that? So I will darken this one, so you have a bit. Okay, so uh, it's quite dark here, but you can see that uh, here is a specular, specular reflection, right? And this one, the middle one is very bright. The, the, the periphery one, the, the next to the boundary one is not that bright, right? That brightness of the specular highlight is because of WS, the geometrical profile of the specular reflection. So you have a diffuse WD will decide this intensity here is, you know, in the middle will be very bright. 
in the edges of the ball here will be a bit darker, right? And that is because WD. The same as the intensity of the big specular pixels here also depends on WS. So anyway, so that's uh, the basic idea. Any questions here? The difference between WD and WS? Okay. So now, uh, in total, uh, in, in general, here WS multiplied by SS because SS is actually in, in, the, in the homogeneous surface, SS is not affected by the object color. It's independent from object color. It only depends on the light color. And because SS is independent from, from the light color, we can multiply SS because SS become a scalar value, not RGB, but a scalar grayscale because SS is grayscale then it multiplied by the grayscale of WS so that's why it become W prime S because again SS is independent from lambda if SS is independent from lambda there is no color information and it become pure white okay so that's the the model the physical model that we have here now if you have a camera capturing the in, the 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 reflection of the light this is the light reflected from the object and captured by your camera remember in the beginning of our course uh, you have filters rgb filters in your camera right and this rgb filters is really have an integral function uh, in, integral of the sensitivity of the sensor so this qr qg and qb are the sensitivity of your sensor Sensor here means the, the color filter R, G, and B. Uh, I hope that you remember that there is a, in human, there are three different, right? Different, different uh, curves, long one, the middle one, and the short one. For human, we have three kind of uh, curves. So the same in, in this case, uh, you know, RGB, you have only one value. You have to, inter to integrate uh, based on this color sensitivity. We discussed this in the beginning. Maybe you forgot some of you. I can remind you that you know some people only have two two curves uh, instead of three. In that case, what is it called? It's called color blind, right? If some people have a color blind, means that this uh, instead of three, they only have one or two. And we remember in some population, uh, some certain sample of people, very few of them actually, uh, they also have four. Four sensitivity means there's four uh, QR, QB, Q, QG, and Q another Q, right? It is four sensitivities, and in, for them, it becomes more colorful. The world is more colorful, literally more colorful. You can search, uh, you know, four color channel human for human eyes. There are some people actually have four. Okay. Anyway, so this is RGB. So we create a tree uh, from this uh, integral function. And in, in the end, that's our model. So that's well, how we model uh, the pixel value. So this pixel value is integral function of I and the color sensitivity. Anyway, so then uh, some times ago, uh, in the, the person is from CMU, Carnegie Mellon University, proposed this dichromatic reflection model. Uh, and this reflection model is that it's combination of these two terms, uh, ID here and IS. And now we have B bar and G bar. And B bar is actually integral function that I mentioned before. Uh, B is for the diffuse reflection and G is equally for the specular reflection. So we, instead of integral function, we just clump this integral function into just B, the color of the diffuse object. In this case, the green color of this object become B, right? And the, the difference in terms of the pixel value is because of WD, but the color of the object is based on B bar. This is B uh, in RGB in color channels, in color factors. And G is uh, also representing the color of the diffuse uh, specular reflection here. It is not necessary to be white. If your light is white, it is white. But if your light is uh, red, it, it will be red. Okay. So that's the, the model, the model that we use. 
which is called dichromatic refraction model. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you take uh, or want to take computer graphics. In computer graphics, this one is very important because if you want to create this kind of synthetic object, you have to know uh, this kind of model. Okay, anyway, so this is called dichromatic refraction model. And now to continue, we also need to know the concept of chromaticity. What is chromaticity? Chromaticity is uh, simply the normally normalized RGB value. So if you have I, I is your RGB value, I, R, I, G, I, B, then for certain channel, for example, IR, you divide that with IR plus IG plus IB. The same for IB, the same for IG. So this is just a simple normalized color. So chromaticity, which is used a lot in color science, is basically normalized RGB. And, and the implication of that is that in chromaticity, there is no brightness. So brightness is canceled out. Only the color that is captured in this chromaticity. And if we have chromaticity sigma in this case, so we have sigma r, sigma g, sigma b, and we have i, r, i, I g, i, b. i is a three-dimensional information because you have r, g, and b. And how about chromaticity? What is the dimensionality of chromaticity? It's on the two dimension. Because i, r plus i, g plus i, b equals to one. Okay, so because the I R I, I sigma sigma R sigma G sigma B equals to one, then it's a two-dimensional information. So chromaticity is 2D, uh, R is 3D. Anyway, so what does it mean by that intuitively? Intuitively, if you have a value of intensity I R I G I B in this value, for example, then you will have this kind of appearance of the of the pixels. This is uh, with the value of, of, of these values here. And the chromaticity of this is that one, 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.43, 0 0.21, and 0 0.36. And the sum of this equals to one, okay? So if you have another pixel value, for example, you have this value, one to nine, 63, and 108. If you see this in the in terms of the pixels, then it will be uh, look like that. It's still purple, but because of intensity is, is darker. But the chromaticity will be exactly the same. So chromaticity capture the color of, of the pixels independent from the brightness. And that's called chromaticity. Okay, any question here for, for, for chromaticity? Right, so now, uh, with this chromaticity, uh, besides this chromaticity, I just want to remind you that we have a model for I. I is the diffuse component, WD and multiplied B, and multi uh, plus the stickler component. Stickler component is WS multiplied by G. So that is the physics uh, of the definition of I. And if you combine them, assuming WS equal to zero, for example, then uh, this is diffuse reflection. So you will have this WD, uh, WD will be canceled up. So assume that W is equal to zero means it's diffuse reflection without specularity. Then sigma actually depends on, or the chromaticity capture the color of the diffuse pixels. So B here is the diffuse color, right? And if you normalize, then it is the diffuse chromaticity or diffuse color. So that's the called diffuse chromaticity. And diffuse chromaticity, let's say we define this diffuse chromaticity as uh, gamma. Is that gamma? I think gamma, right? Uh, no, lambda, sorry. So this is lambda. Uh, lambda uh, is a diffuse chromaticity. It's the same as sigma, but sigma for diffuse, com diffuse uh, component or diffuse reflection. So if you do the same for specular, Chromaticity means that WD equal to zero and WS on zero, then you will have gamma. And gamma here is the chromaticity of your diffuse component. Diffuse component is again, is a, 
is the white things that I showed you just before, right? right? So this part here, so the color of that of that specularity. So that's the basic idea of this uh, chromaticity based uh, model. So we have diffuse chromaticity, we have a gamma chroma, uh, a specular chromaticity, and previously we have, uh, you know, uh, model uh, dichromatic reflection model. So I just want to remind you again, this is the dichromatic reflection model. And if we change this into chromaticity, then the chromaticity based uh, dichromatic model will look like this one. So this one is, uh, again, uh, is diffuse uh, based model. So chromaticity based diffuse model. So in, in, instead of WD, we have MD because uh, because we change the so everything that is that is non one because now lambda is a is a normalized value so the the rest of the value will go to WD which is become MD okay so MS here is um, WS multiplied by the 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 sum of all this so MD is the WD plus the sum of B and ms equal to ws prime multiplied by the sum of g okay so don't worry about this uh, just remember that we now have this chromaticity based model md and ms okay so based on this now let's look at the problem of color constancy so basically we have this input of an image uh, lit by yellow is kind of light and we want to transform this into whitish kind of uh, light. So we want to transform the color of the light. So we estimate the color and then we remove the color. That's basic idea using this model. Okay, so using this chromaticity based model. So anyway, so that's the input in image intensity, uh, the, the pixels value uh, as the, our input. Uh, for example, in this case, whatever the pixel value that you can choose from this image here. And then this lambda gamma is the, is the color that we want to estimate because gamma is the color of the light. Okay, so if you can have gamma, that's the goal. From I, how can we estimate gamma? That is the question then. We thought knowing all the parameters here. Okay, so that's the, the, the problem statement. Given I, how we can get gamma. Okay, so for this one, there are many different methods uh, uh, in the literature, statistical base, physics base, and so on. Uh, so for example, Trinker et al. here, uh, they assume that this kind of objects will have this kind of T-shaped uh, kind of uh, distribution. So the, the longer distribution is diffuse, the, or the pink arrow here representing the specular uh, function. So if you can decompose this blue and the pink lines, then we can estimate the light color because the light color is the pink arrow here. So the pink arrow here is the light, the yellow light here. And if you look at the uh, synthetic data, it's quite clean, but if you look at the real data, it's very messy. We cannot find the T-shape here. And this kind of algorithm only based on single surface. If you have multiple surface, it doesn't work. So that's what happened uh, in the in, in the the other method is using A and B. So if you have A that is uh, lit by the same light surface and B, then in chromaticity space uh, sigma G and sigma R chromaticity space, then you can have two clusters and then you intersect this one because they are the same color. Then the intersection will give you the light color. Okay, so this is the uh, idea of the existing method. Um, another thing uh, that you can have a solution is called Planckian locus. So Planck, I'm not sure how many you know the Planck. Do you know Planck? It's uh, Albert Einstein. Some people say this teacher of Albert Einstein, but anyway, uh, it's a predecessor of, of Albert Einstein. It's called Planck. Uh, and Planck proposed this uh, called Planckian formula to describe this kind of light. So this kind of light is called black body radiator. So it is totally black metal. If you have black, totally black metal and you burn it, 
with 900 Kelvin of heat, it will be reddish. Okay, so red kind of color will emit it when you burn uh, this kind of black body radiator. And if it is 1,750 Kelvin, it starts to be yellow or yellowish. And if it is 3,200, it becomes whitish. And if it is more than 5,500, it becomes bluish. <clears throat> so, you know, you, you, you have stove at home perhaps, right? And you, if you start uh, <clears throat> putting the flame on and put the gas much higher, it becomes from red, it becomes blue, right? Because blue means that it's more hot. So that's this kind of color from the black body radiator is the natural color of the light. So for example, for the sun, the sun follow this kind of uh, light color. This one, for example, this is also follow this kind of uh, color. So this is natural lights can be modeled by this black body radiator. And this black body and Planck, based on this black body radiator, he created a formula. And this formula, given the, the, the heat, given the Kelvin, the value of the Kelvin, it can predict the color of the object. Okay, so there is a correlation between light colors and temperature. And this is called color temperature. Okay, so color temperature means that it's, it also represents the color of the natural light. It doesn't work for human, human man-made light though, because man-made man -man light can be purple, can be green, can be so on, right? And that's one, this kind of color will not be in this black body radiator color. Only natural light can have this color. So based on this color, we can have the temperature, the correlation between temperature and the correlation between the possible light sources. So this, this blue and the red are the possible natural light colors. Okay. So the very blue, if you go to the North country and it is a winter, for example, the sky can be very, very blue. And the object will, although this is a white object, a snow, for example, the snow can look like a bluish kind of color. That's because of this natural light of the sky. But anyway, so this one is all the color, possible color in, in, in nature. And if you plot this into chromatic space, then you will have this kind of locus or curve. And this locus is called Planckian locus represent the all possible natural light colors. So based on this Planckian locus, it has become a constraint because now you can have this Planckian locus as possible light colors, and then you can have this kind of white cluster. So you plot this white, this you crop this one, and this become a cluster in this, this space. Now you can suddenly, um, can predict the light colors only from a single surface instead of two, right? So this is the, the method that happened at that time uh, until uh, early, early 2000. Early 2000 people still use this kind of approach. It is, uh, Finlayson is actually published uh, uh, in 2001, I think, right? And that's how he can get this one. And all this uh, now, the method that is proposed here is to deal with uniform color, but also highly textured surface. So how we can handle uniform color and also at the same time handle highly textured surface, no segmentation and have to be applicable for all uh, illumination without constraint Planckian locus. So the basic idea again is uh, using chromaticity model combined with intensity, so you have this model, reflection model, dichromatic reflection model based on chromaticity. And then you have a chromaticity definition here. You combine uh, these two and you do the derivation. And finally, you will have this kind of equation. Uh, and this equation describes the correlation between I, the intensity, and gamma. Gamma is something that you want to, to find. So how we can solve this one, again, the input is I, what you want is gamma without knowing everything else, right? So based on this, uh, uh, we can propose, you can further do the derivation. It's a lot of mathematics there. 
uh, but you can get into this uh, equation that in the end you have a chromaticity in correlation with gamma. So in this case, chromatic chromaticity is known. You can calculate easily from the input pixels, right? And I is a pixel input pixels. So I here, the sum of I is known. Chromaticity is also known. The only unknown is P and gamma. Okay, so P here is actually uh, uh, some, some geometrical factor of the, of the surface, uh, diffuse surface, but the gamma is the eventual uh, output that we want. So we need to solve this equation. And in this case, uh, we can use intensity, inverse intensity, because this one, the, the y x, the, the x axis is inverse intensity, and the y axis is actually chromaticity. So we can create inverse intensity chromaticity space to solve this problem. So if you create such a, such a space, so this one is the in x, x in y axis is sigma, in x axis is inverse intensity, right? So if we have this kind of space, and then if we have an input image something like that using a single input surface, and we plot this into this uh, space, then we will have that kind of distributions. And it is proven mathematically that all these pixels here in this the cluster here, actually there is a line, multi, many, many lines, because this equation is actually a line equation, right? So this line equation represents there is a line here, line there, line here, and so on and so forth. And the offset of this line, all this line will have value in the y-axis and that value is gamma okay so that's something that we want to find gamma and we know that all the lines so it, the illustration here is that all this line all the line will have to uh, gamma value in the y-axis now the problem is that how we can find this gamma value because we do not know the line we do not know which pixels have the same P or P1 or PJ or PN here. We do not know that one. So the idea is that, uh, yeah, this one is about multiple surface is the same uh, regardless. So all they have a form aligned and the, the Y axis, because we only have one color, surface color, then we only have one gamma value in the Y axis. Okay. so. <clears throat> Now, how we can solve the problem? Uh, the first one is a half transformation. I'm not really sure if you know half transformation. And the second one is intersection counting or histogram. So let's start with half transformation. What is half transformation? <clears throat> half transformation is that if you have this space, y and x space, and imagine that this is y, right? sigma is y. Inverse intensity here is x. And this one is M, and this one is B, for example. So this is a linear, simple linear equation. So half transform means that we transform this space into the parameter space. What is the parameter space here is M, M here, and uh, B here. In this case, it's P and gamma. So we transform that one into gamma and P, or the parametric space, M and B. Okay, so if you transform this one, if you if you make this kind of space, parametric space, which is called half space, then what happened is that for one point here, <clears throat> for one point here, it will create you one line. Another point here, if you have three points, P1, P2, P3, you will get three lines. So in that's the difference between X, Y space and parametric space. In, in x y space, one point, if you transform that one point into the parametric space, it becomes a line. If you have three points, then you can have three lines. If these three points create a, create a, a line, if these three po points form a line, then there will be some intersection of this line. And the intersection indicates the same gamma. Because there's only one gamma in these three points. Is that clear? And that is called half transformation. It is very useful for 
or edge detection, for example. But in this case, we use this to solve our linear problem. <clears throat> and if we have different P1, Pj, Pn, it, then we have three different kind of intersection. But all these intersection have the same gamma because all this intersection, uh, this line, I mean, will have same gamma. So this one have the same gamma value here. And that intersection is something that we have to find. Uh, if we find the intersection and then we count the intersection. So intersection in X exists. So we count in every intersection in X exists. In other words, <clears throat> we, we count that. And this is the counting in the X axis, the gamma X axis. We count how many intersection here. We count how many intersection of the line here. And then the peak here will give you your gamma value. And this one <clears throat> again works for, <clears throat> the idea is that the input image, you transform into inverse intensity chromatic space, you have half transform, and then you can use histogram <clears throat> of the intersection to find gamma. And this is the experimental results for single surface. You have that kind of distributions, and then uh, you count the intersection. It's obvious that intersection is close to 0 0.4, right? And that's the ground truth. Oh, sorry, that's the estimation. And this is the ground truth using white surface. So if you have a white paper, for example, then you can use white paper to estimate the light color. And as you can see, the, the prediction is quite close. <clears throat> and <clears throat> this one is for multiple surface. So we have multiple surface, it means that we have multiple clusters. But then in the end, the counting of the intersection give you the highest value. And that one indicate the correct value for your uh, for your light color. So that's the estimation, and that's the ground truth. And if even if the color is very complex like this, for example, then you can still see the counting of the intersection. The highest intersection is still very robust, although the cluster is not really clear anymore because it's clumped into one one color, one place. <clears throat> So even if you know uh, a surface like this, an uh, image like this, which is very complex, is a real world uh, image. There are many, many different clusters, but all these clusters will have the same value in y axis. And if we count the intersection, the intersection is robustly indicate one value uh, in of gamma, and that's the, in, the estimation. Okay, so this is how we can estimate the light color highlight so specularity like this one specular here and there is very useful even for human to know the color of the light okay. and that's the one thing that's useful from this i will explain uh, maybe next week uh, how we can remove the the highlight and why a highlight removal uh, is an also interesting problem in low level vision because in the end after we remove the light color we can also remove the specular highlight here. And as a result of that, we have a diffuse component, which is more consistent because if you take picture from different angle, it will give you the same color independent from these specular highlights. Okay, so this is uh, the story, half a story of the low level vision. We have noise suppression using ROF. We have light estimation using the specular uh, indication of specular cues, and next week we will continue with this uh, specular removal, and then continue to wait fog removal. So I will give you a, a very quick look uh, and on on fog removal. So again, this is nothing to do with deep learning. So we don't use deep learning at all, and using physics to solve the problem. Okay, so. <clears throat> Let me see if I can show you. Okay, so, so this is the results. Uh, so in the left is the input using bad weather, and foggy here in this case. And this one using physics approach to remove the fog. So as you can see, there are many, many information that you can extract from this kind of image. Okay, so this is called defogging or dehazing. 
Okay, so before we end uh, today lecture, any questions? Any question, anyone? Yeah, I hope that you can uh, attend next week lecture. I'm not really sure whether the next week will be the last lecture of our course. Uh, let's see what happened next week. But uh, there's a possibility that next week will be the last final lecture uh, for our course. Uh, because we already have all, discussed all the topics in the curriculum. Uh, and <clears throat> I don't want to burden you with more, more, more things. So yeah, so next week will be the likely to be the last lectures. And next week agenda is that I will discuss this and I will show you the, our, we will do review, review what kind of this, uh, topics that we discussed from the beginning until the end. If you have questions, please ask uh, next week. <clears throat> You can also ask kind of questions related to exam if you have something in mind. And I also explain again uh, what our lab is doing. Uh, we have a lot of different kind of uh, topics in, in our labs. And it's likely that I have a few PhD position uh, next year. So if you're interested, you can look at my website. You can, you know, if you aspire to be a PhD student, you might want to try, right? Uh, so yeah, I will see you next week for that. Okay, thanks everyone. I will see you again. Some problem with the CE. Uh, I wrote some hours of well, and uh, you, uh, uh, yeah, you have to contact the CE uh, yeah, for assignment.